Thank you, friends, for joining us today by means of this radio broadcast as we study what the Bible has to say. I'm Bobby Graham, visiting the area from Athens, Alabama. I'm delighted to be with you by means of the radio program, and I do encourage your taking your Bible and verifying anything and everything that I have to say to make sure that God said it first. If God said it first, then it's immaterial whether I say it or not. It's still the truth, and by it we shall all be judged. On the other hand, if God has not taught it in His Word, even though I teach it and insist upon it with great vigor, uh, it is wrong, it is not right, it is not in accord with God's way, and you ought to reject it. But on the other hand, if you find that the Bible truly does teach it, then you must receive it under the saving of your soul, regardless of whether you have believed it in the past, whether your parents before you have believed it, and whether anybody in the whole world believes it. You still must believe it under the saving of your soul. I'm interested today in the role that one's conscience plays in his relationship with God. I've met many people in my efforts to teach the gospel, people who had the idea that because they believed something sincerely and engaged in the earnest practice of that thing, in other words, because they maintained a good conscience, that's all that they need to do to be saved. And that idea is rather prevalent, widespread, isn't it? I may be speaking to a number of people today who believe that regardless of what the Bible teaches, just as long as you believe what you believe sincerely, God will be pleased with your efforts. I want us to think along this line and examine it not merely from the standpoint of what I think or what you think, but rather from the viewpoint of what God has to say concerning the matter. So I encourage you to take your Bible and to study with me. We begin today by asking the question, what is conscience? And then we shall move to consider conscience as the product or the effect of one's education, one's teaching. In the third place today, we're going to consider Paul, the Apostle Paul about whom the New Testament says much. We're going to look at Paul especially as an example of one who had a good conscience. In the fourth place, we're going to see that feelings are unreliable, that they are subjective and cannot be depended upon to determine what is right or wrong. And then finally today, for the reasons already indicated, we're going to emphasize the point that conscience is not the standard of right and wrong. I trust that in our study today, you will learn something that will be helpful to you. Let us think, then, along this line. What is conscience? The Bible teaches, of course that conscience is the moral sense that is within each one of us. It is the sense or the awareness of moral possibilities, moral potential that exists within every human being. It is ours by divine endowment. The Bible tells us that when God made man, when God made Adam, Back in the beginning, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, He made him in His own image or after His own likeness. This simply means that God made man with the capacity to have relationship, association, fellowship, or communion with God. Man thus is endowed with the moral potential to consider the information that he receives, whether from God or from Satan, to make moral choices, to exercise free will, and to reflect upon the choices that he has made in order to determine their rightness or their wrongness. 
But likewise, right along with conscience and the moral choice that one makes, there, of course, is the compunction or the pang of guilt accompanying it. This all is a part of conscience, and it is summed up in the basic meaning of conscience, which has to do with one's knowledge within himself of what he is doing. That's what conscience is. It is the moral sense within us that determines whether we consider our own conduct right or wrong. You see, conscience sits in judgment upon what one does. Conscience weighs one's actions and one's thoughts and one's beliefs and determines them to be right or wrong. Conscience itself, though, must make this decision or this judgment on the basis of the information that previously has been given to one. Conscience involves the feeling of pleasure or commendation when a person does what he thinks is right. But it also involves the feeling of pain or condemnation when that one does what he thinks is wrong. Yes, my friends, conscience is very important. The importance of conscience depends upon its being something of a moral governor. Just as a governor might be placed upon a speedometer on an automobile or some other kind of vehicle for the purpose of monitoring speed and keeping one from exceeding that speed, even so conscience is a moral governor. A person can disregard conscience. He can go beyond conscience. He can fall short of conscience. He can make decisions that are not in keeping with conscience. And in doing so, of course, he disregards or he abuses his conscience. And he does so to his own hurt or loss because a conscience can be abused to the point that it becomes seared as with a hot iron, as the Apostle Paul wrote to the young preacher Timothy in one of his letters to him. But conscience has a very important role. We now consider as well that conscience is a product of one's education or one's teaching. If a child has been taught to steal, do you think it will bother his conscience when he takes something that is not his own? Why, of course not. And that is precisely why some children, even in our society, are thieves. They've been taught that thievery or stealing is acceptable. If a child, on the other hand, has been taught that it is wrong to steal... It will bother his conscience when he goes to take something that belongs to another person. Why the difference between the two different children? It is because the two were taught differently. The first was taught wrong, that is, that stealing was all right, but he felt he was doing right because of what he had been taught to be right. This shows that conscience is not a safe guide. Conscience, you see, is the product of what one has been taught. On the continent of Africa, many grow up thinking that they ought to worship idols and ancestors, and in all sincerity they practice such. But many of us who have been taught according to the Scriptures in the Bible understand that such is woefully out of place. It is wrong. What's the difference? The difference is the source of one's teaching. Conscience always reflects what that teaching is. And thus the approval of conscience rests upon one's conforming to what he has been taught is right. Whereas the disapproval by conscience means that one is not conforming to what he has been taught to be right. Conscience itself, though, is not a safe guide in religion. Consider with me the role of conscience, even from the standpoint of the Bible, for just a minute or two this morning. In John chapter 8, when the woman taken in adultery was brought to Jesus, the Bible tells us the reply that Jesus gave there in verse 7 when he said, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And then verse 8, 
And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. Notice, they were convicted by their conscience. Conscience did not necessarily, in this case, determine what was right and wrong, but it reflected what they believed to be right and wrong because of the standard of teaching that they had accepted or subscribed to. Turn with me to Romans chapter 2, if you would, in your own Bible at home. It's wonderful to know that people are interested enough in God's Word to take their Bibles and to study for themselves to make sure that what I'm teaching is the truth. In Romans chapter 2, at verse 15, while discussing the Gentiles of ancient times, the apostle made this statement, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing one another. The point is this, my friends. Conscience either approves or disapproves what one does in his life. Or to use the words found here in verse 15 of Romans 2, conscience either accuses or excuses one. Now the child who is taught while young that it is right to steal will be able to go and steal someone else's food, someone else's animals, someone else's toys with the approval of his conscience. His conscience will not accuse him but will will rather excuse his conduct. Whereas my conscience, and your conscience probably, would accuse us. It would condemn us. It would make us feel bad because we've done something that we believe to be wrong. But that child has done something that he's taught and thus believes to be right. You see the point? Conscience is the product of one's education, one's teaching. One's information. Let us consider that. As we move to our third point, we deal with the idea that Paul himself is a wonderful example of the role of conscience in serving God. The Bible tells us in the 23rd chapter of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 23 at verse 1, Paul said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. This is a statement where Paul affirmed such matters before the Jewish Sanhedrin, the high court of the Jews there in Jerusalem. Paul said, My life until now has been characterized by a good conscience. That, my friends, is very important. It is important for one to maintain a good conscience because if he disregards conscience, if he abuses conscience, if he lives in violation of conscience, if he runs roughshod over his conscience, then he's going to find his conscience failing to operate, failing to function as it ought before long. It will become seared as with a hot iron, as we suggested earlier. And just as a blister or a callus on one's hand might be formed by a hot iron touching it. And then, of course, for a period of time, a period of several days, that area of blister or that area where a callus forms uh, seems almost without feeling, without sensitivity. The nerve endings there have been destroyed, you see. And a person can even pinch it or poke it, or prod it, or even take a pen and stick it. And if he doesn't go too deep, down into the area of the quick, into the area of live nerve endings, then he's not going to feel any pain. Why? Because that area is there because he's been burned. His skin has been abused. It's been seared as with a hot iron. And so it is with one's conscience. The Bible says a person can do wrong so many times that conscience no longer prods him. 
Conscience no longer accuses him. Conscience no longer condemns him. Paul had not lived that way, though. Paul had lived before God in all good conscience until that very day. But now remember, he was guided by a conscience that had been informed or taught or instructed that he ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus Christ. That's what he said to King Agrippa over in Acts 26 at verse 9. Hear what Paul said there. Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, when Paul was doing those things contrary to Christ, he was doing wrong. But he thought he was doing right because that was his teaching. That was his upbringing. That was his spiritual education. And thus Paul enjoyed the approval of his conscience even when he persecuted Christians. When he was holding the clothing of those that were stoning Stephen as recorded in Acts the 7th chapter, his conscience did not accuse him, but rather excused him. It commended him for what he was doing because he was doing something he had taught, been taught to be right. Do you see why I say that Paul is a good example of one who maintained a good conscience, though his conscience was uninformed or misinformed? We need to be aware of that because it may be that our consciences have been misinformed. We may have been taught the right thing or the wrong thing. If we've been taught the right thing, that is what the Bible teaches, then of course our conscience will, will properly accuse us when we do that which is wrong in the sight of God but they will properly excuse us when we do that which is right in the sight of God, as taught in the Bible. A lot of people, though, think that just because conscience approves, just because conscience excuses one's actions, those actions have to be right. Well, it wasn't so in Paul's case, was it? In Paul's case, his conscience excused him. His conscience approved what he was doing that was wrong when he was persecuting Christians, when he was killing them, when he was putting them in prison, when he was denying the name of Jesus Christ, his conscience approved it all the while. So you see, conscience is not necessarily dependable. Conscience truly is not the standard of right and wrong. Hear what the Bible says in other passages. In Proverbs chapter 14, at verse 12, we see that personal feelings can lead a person astray. Here's what Solomon said in the long ago, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end of it is the way of death. There is a way that seems right. Somebody says, well, it just seems all right to me to believe this or to do that. Well, it doesn't matter what it seems to me or to you or to anybody else. That doesn't determine whether it's right or not. That just determines that I have been taught this to be right. And when I violate my conscience, when I don't act in compliance with that which I've been taught, then my conscience will accuse me. It will condemn me. Paul's conscience commended him when he did wrong because he'd been taught that the wrong was was right. And likewise, sometimes... People might be taught that the right is wrong. And when they're taught that, their conscience will approve that which is wrong instead of that which is right. So we need to be aware of this, and we can become aware of it by thinking about Paul. Paul is a wonderful example of how conscience, while followed carefully and sincerely, does not necessarily guarantee one's course of action to be right in the sight of the Lord. Paul said, I have lived before God in all good conscience until this day. But that day when he was walking along the road to Damascus, and the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him in the bright light, blinded him from heaven, he learned how wrong he had been. 
He learned that his father's religion was wrong. He learned that conscience is not necessarily a safe guide in religion. And he had to do an about face. He had to do a U-turn. He had to repent. And he did repent and began following Christ. He began proclaiming the very faith, the very message of the gospel, which he previously had sought to destroy. Paul later wrote in Galatians 1, verse 23. Yes, there is a way that seems to be right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And then I remind you too of Jeremiah 10, verse 23, which says, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself, for it is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. There is not the wherewithal in any human being to guide or to direct one's own steps. Not even conscience is a safe guide. Only conscience that is properly taught, that is scripturally informed, that is righteously educated, can guide one in doing the right. And only then will conscience accuse one when he does what the Bible shows to be wrong and likewise excuse one when he does what the Bible teaches to be right. Personal feelings, though, are unreliable. If you'll stop and think for just a minute, you'll know. Personal feelings are altogether subjective, are they not? Subjective. The Bible is objective. That is, it exists external to oneself, outside oneself. What was it that Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 10.23? The way of not man is not in himself, for it is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. The guidance must come from the Lord through the Scriptures. Only the direction that is there found can lead one aright or point one toward heaven. Oh, how we need to understand this, my friends. And so, you you see, it's not a matter of what I think or what you think or what the conscience of either one of us will approve. That's not the final test. The final test is, what does the Bible teach? And if my conscience is properly taught by the Bible, then my conscience will align itself in accusing or excusing on the basis of the biblical standard instead of on the basis of personal standard. But conscience and feelings are altogether subjective. They're influenced by something else. Whereas the Bible is objective. It is the objective standard of truth. It is the yardstick that is applicable to the people of the entire world. When I say that feelings are unreliable because they are subjective, let me illustrate what I mean. Feelings will approve or endorse beliefs that are opposite to each other. Let me show you. The very ideas that we've already talked about this morning would suggest such. There are children who are taught that stealing is acceptable. Don't their consciences and thus their feelings approve such? They certainly do. But there are also children who are taught that stealing is wrong. Stealing is sinful. And their consciences condemn them when they steal. And thus you see what I mean when I say that feelings, subjective feelings will approve opposite ways of life. The feelings of one will approve stealing, whereas the feelings of another will condemn stealing. The same thing is true with killing or lying. A lot of people grow up thinking that lying is the way to go. Their consciences approve lying. Others, however, do not. And that's what I'm talking about. Subjective feelings will approve lying in one case, but disapprove it and condemn it in another case. Or to use the words of Romans 2.15, will accuse in one case or excuse in the other case. But let me illustrate it now from the area of religion. A lot of people say, my feelings tell me 
that Joseph Smith was truly a prophet of God. In fact, the encouragement is given by our Latter-day Saints friends sometimes when they come to talk to us. They say, if you'll just pray, God will reveal to you and you'll have the feeling that, that Joseph Smith is truly a prophet from God and that the Book of Mormon is true. But now, my friends, others depend upon similar feelings to say that Joseph Smith is not a prophet and that the Bible is God's Word and not the Book of Mormon. That's my point. My point is that feelings are totally subjective. They lead different people in different directions. They lead one person to believe one thing. They lead another person to believe the opposite. Feelings lead some people to think that you don't have to do anything to be saved. Whereas others are led by their own feelings to believe that, yes, you do have to at least believe on Christ. And others say, well, you have to do more than that. But why do they say these different things? Why do they teach these different doctrines? Because of their feelings. And so it is dependent not on what one feels, not upon conscience, but upon the Word of God, and the Word of God needs to be that which informs or influences or educates our conscience so that our feelings will be in line with what the Bible teaches and will reflect properly our doing what the Bible teaches. We need to be aware then of these very matters. Conscience is not the standard of right and wrong. If conscience is not, what is? The Bible, the Scriptures. Hear what the Apostle Paul said about such in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. Every Scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible is the standard of right and wrong. It is the standard for doctrine, that is, for teaching. It is the standard for reproving, that is, correcting or pointing out the error in what one believes or what one practices. It is the standard also for correcting, that is, uh, mending that which is wrong, making the correction that is there which is shown by the reproof that the Bible gives. And it is the standard also for instructing or training in righteousness. So just mark it down, my friends. If it pertains to teaching, reproving, correcting, or instructing, training in righteousness, then the Scripture is altogether adequate for that. Conscience is not. But the Word of God is. If we've been taught things that are not in harmony with the Word of God and follow our conscience, our conscience will urge us to do what is wrong in God's sight, that which the Bible does not teach and will keep us from doing what is right. We need to be aware of these matters because of the very important role of conscience. And I trust that our study today has been helpful to all of us. Thank you for joining us on this occasion.